And of course, with all of those different uh, circumstances and uh, different bishops and patriarchates competing, they aren't all saying the same thing. Um, you know, we have uh, perhaps uh, on one side, someone like the highly revered patriarch Catholicos Ilia of Georgia, calling upon his priests to um, celebrate the liturgy and to sprinkle holy water in the streets, uh, encouraging parents to sprinkle holy water on their children morning and evening and that type of thing too. Uh, on another side, some uh, bishops thinking that it's important to tell priests that their right hand of blessing could uh, possibly be or probably be uh, an incubator for the virus and not to let people kiss their hand. So obviously not everyone agrees on exactly the best approach uh, or what is proper or not proper. Uh, but we're all trying to take, I think, this, these matters seriously and to come up with some uh, life-saving, life-nourishing guidelines. There are a lot of opinions uh, about these matters, and I want to strongly encourage all of you and to go on the record of saying uh, this is not a time for opinions, and this is not a time for evaluating our bishops' opinions and judgments. We really should avoid that completely uh, and instead uh, accept uh, the will of God and try to find the way to do the most good that we can uh, in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I myself am a priest of the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese, which is an archdiocese of the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch, Patriarchate of Antioch and all the East. And uh, just yesterday, our patriarch, uh, his beatitude, Patriarch John X, uh, issued some guidelines to the churches. And our Father in God, His Eminence, Metropolitan Joseph, just today has sent some uh, updated guidelines. Let me share some of those guidelines and some of the reasoning behind them. And they've asked us for a short time to avoid uh, gathering together uh, in groups of more than 10. That is, they're asking us to cooperate with uh, our president here in the United States and with our local officials who are asking us uh, to take this plague seriously and for the sake of a person's health to not gather in groups of more than 10. Uh, they're asking us to um, celebrate the services just with the priests, the celebrants at the holy table uh, and the chanters and the servers uh, at the holy table and to do our best to live stream, stream, to live stream these services uh, into the homes of our people and um, to also make a way, a safe way to be able to provide uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion uh, to people uh, without there being more than 10 people uh, in the church. So they expect us to do uh, the private liturgy privately just with celebrants and chanters and servers uh, and then find a way for those who need Holy Communion um, to be able to have them come and receive Holy Communion. This will be a lot of work for the priests, but it's saving work and it's sanctifying work. They've also asked us to labor to keep the church open for private prayer so that people can come in uh, by themselves and, and light candles and pray to God. Uh, they've also uh, asked us to publish reader services, to infuse uh, home worship, domestic worship uh, in, the, in the homes of our faithful. I was particularly touched to see uh, in his eminence's letter uh, a reference to the life of St. Mary of Egypt, and I'd like to read that to you because I find it to be very edifying. This is a guidance that His Eminence has provided uh, to encourage us how, with what spirit we should embrace these changes uh, that are going on in this unique situation of viral threat. Uh, this is a quote. While we hoped that these kinds of measures would be unnecessary, uh, I ask that we keep in mind the example of the monastic rule kept by the Brotherhood of St. Zosima described in the life of St. Mary of Egypt. Quote, after crossing the Jordan, they all scattered far and wide in different directions. And this was the rule of life that they had and which they all observed, neither to talk to one another nor to know how each one lived and fasted. If they did happen to catch sight of one another, they went to another part of the country, living alone and always singing to God and at a definite time eating a very small quantity of food. In this way, they spent the whole of the great fast and used to return to the monastery a week before the resurrection of Christ. On the eve of Palm Sunday, each one returned having his own conscience as the witness of his labor, and no one asked another how he had spent his time in the desert. Such were the rules of the monastery. And then His Eminence continues. 
Although our time of social distancy is not quite the same as asceticism, let us treat it as a, sac a sacrificial offering of love to God and to our neighbor. We hope that this will be a time reminiscent of the home churches of the early days of the faith and that there may be a hidden blessing of families being together to pray and nurture one another in the faith. Let us continue our work of prayer, repentance, and almsgiving during this time and beseech God to grant us to come together once again as those monks of the Sinai Desert to commemorate his life-giving and saving passion and glorious third-day resurrection. Uh, may it be blessed for, for everyone to embrace uh, these challenging uh, circumstances and the threat of this virus uh, with that kind of spirit where we're constantly uh, singing uh, to the Lord. Don't think, dear ones, don't think another minute about what you would do if you were patriarch or you were metropolitan or you were the bishop of your diocese or your priest. It's not edifying to think that way. Thank God you aren't. <laughs> Thank God you aren't. You don't want to be. And uh, may God inspire our great men of the church, our holy fathers, to be able to carry this, carry this pastoral burden uh, well in this very difficult time.